Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And you know, we love to bring you information to help you see if we can give you enough information to be able to navigate this daunting landscape of cannabis across the country, either through dispensaries or some of you are still buying from the black and gray market. We want to give you some information that will help you make good, positive choices for yourself and your family in case you need to do so. And in today's enlightening episode of Let's Be Blunt, we're going to be venturing into the evolving world of cannabis and its potential to heal and transform lives. Our guest offers a deeply personal narrative on overcoming the challenges following a life-altering stroke through the unconventional route of cannabis therapy. His story is not just one of recovery, but of re rediscovery and breaking down the barriers and stigmas associated with cannabis use. I want to give a special shout out to Dustin Hawksworth and the rest of our friends at Fat Nuts Magazine for first sharing the story with us. And I will also say to you that Though this information that you're about to receive today is, is going to be seen by some as being controversial, this is Adam Beltran's personal story. And so for him, this is what he's done. We're not trying to say to you and advocating to anybody out there who's been maybe down the path of having some issues happen in their lives. We're not trying to tell you what to do. We're just trying to give you information to help you navigate the space that you're in trying to see if you can recover from something as devastating as a stroke. Adam Beltran, it's so, so much a pleasure to have you with us today as a guest on Let's Be Blunt, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I did that little dis disclaimer because, you know, I don't want people to say that we're trying to give out medical advice here today. But what we're trying to do is just uh, let people understand experiences. Yeah, I understand. Um, it's, it's important. It's important, an important note to make. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, science would say in some cases that you might be an uh, a, a anecdote of one. I happen to think that, you know, when we get anecdotes that are more than one and they get up in the tens and, and, and 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, it's no longer an anecdote. It's, it's, it's science. And so what people need to do is start researching some of that science. That's just my belief. I'm not saying that for anybody else to run out there and jump on board. But before we go into your story, I want you to tell me a little bit about your background, how you grew up, where you went to school, what were you doing in life, what was going on in your life before the stroke happened? Okay. Well, I'm basically a local of the Los Angeles County, uh, born and raised about 30 minutes up north, depending on how fast you drive. Um, I went to school for business, and I was originally focused on working in the medical field. I started with uh, medical supplies, then went to uh, bioscience where I made IV solutions, um, went to phlebotomy, uh, lab assistant, and then I was supposed to go teach a class on phlebotomy, uh, teach people how to do it. And then that's when I had my stroke. Um, that's, that's where it kind of led me here. So you kind of understood the space of medicine and, and uh, how did you, what did you think of cannabis when you were doing this work? When I was doing the medical field work? Yes. Well, I didn't really have an opinion at that time. Um, I really didn't hear a lot about it, what people are using it for. I'd occasionally run into a patient that said it was helping them. But um, what I really noticed was that patients were kind of bringing up the issue that they were tired of dealing with different symptoms and um, that they wanted to try anything. Right. So that when it ha happened to me, I felt the same way because uh, I read well, uh, different articles. Sure, let's slow down for a second. Let's sure. back up. Let's talk, talk a little bit about when you had your stroke now. This happened back in what, 2016? Yeah, it happened uh, October 20, uh, 2016. I was actually on the freeway when, when I noticed it. Scary. Um, yeah, yeah, I was on the 405. Uh, my left arm got real tired. So I wanted to switch to my right arm to drive with. And I noticed it just lying across my side. It wasn't moving. So I got off the freeway, parked, noticed I couldn't speak. The uh, vision in my right eye kept going in and out. And I started getting a little confused. So um, I basically was around three different hospitals. But you know, in my confusion, I 
didn't even think about going to one or even calling 911 because I couldn't speak. So what I ended up doing was I got back on the freeway and I drove home uh, through 30 minutes of rush hour traffic. It's the hardest drive I've ever had to take. And um, had my girlfriend take me to the hospital. At the, and I stayed there for nine days in the ICU. That's that's incredible. I don't know if you knew this. I think I mentioned it right before we started. But I, like you, have that. That's almost similarly the thing in common. This goes back to 2019. I um, literally was in a gym in a hotel in Manhattan. And um, I was working out. And uh, it really strange for me, because this was one that when I explained to my doctors, they were trying to figure out what was I talking about. But it was almost, I was, I used to be a big meathead, weighthead kind of guy. I was, but before I stroke, I weighed 20 pounds more than I weigh right now. And I literally was doing some very heavy dumbbell squats. I think I was using like 85 to 95 pound dumbbells and I was, I was doing squats. And then I was, and I happened to be in the gym by myself, which was, it was early in the morning. I had an event to go to. I think it was maybe nine o'clock in the morning or eight, eight thirty in the morning. And I, I remember distinctly, I'm in the middle of doing a squat and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I heard this big pop. I heard a noise. Wow. And I looked, I looked around behind me trying to figure out where it came from. And then when I looked back towards the mirror, the entire room started the kaleidoscope. And then I started feeling dizzy and I dropped the weight and, and I had just, you know, I mean, we're kind of close friends with Mem and Oz and I had done a show with Oz a couple months before and about a day or two after the show that I shot with him, he had shot a show about stroke and, um, some of the things that that he were talking about, I started to think and remember, wait a minute, that did I just have a stroke? And I'm looking around, there's no no noise. And I literally I went to sit down and I had difficulty sitting down. I sat on a bench for a second, and all I wanted to do was to lay down. I just thought to myself, let me just lay down for a second. I want to go, no, wait, you can't lay down. If I lay down, I'll never leave here. So, like you, there was nobody there. There was a phone on the wall. I was gonna try to call 911, but I was like, and uh, no, because they're not really. So I ended up having to, I was in a hotel on like the fourth floor where the gym was. My room was on like the ninth floor. The gym was back in the corner of this hotel. So I literally had to, I couldn't, I was trying to walk, but my balance was so far off that I had to hold onto the walls. And I walked my way all the way to the elevator, got the elevator, fell inside the elevator. I didn't fall to the floor, but I grabbed the rails that were there. I hit a button, went up to my room. I had to wall walk all the way down the hotel uh, hallway to get to my room. I you know, banged on the door. My wife was in the shower at the time. I used my key and got in. And then I flopped down on the couch. I was in the in the room. And I said, baby, you need to call 911 and tell them that your husband just had a stroke. And she said, what? I said, I'll tell you. Tell them I just had a stroke. And I was very lucky because in the city of New York at the time that this happened, they had three particular stroke configured emergency vehicles that they would station all, no, two, that they stationed all around the city. That night, the one happened to be stationed about two blocks from my hotel. That particular emergency vehicle picked me up. They brought me down. They, you know, the EMS guys came up to my room and I said, dude, I'm telling you, I think I had a stroke. And the guy said, well, how do you know that? I said, I'm telling you, I think I had a stroke and I, I don't know. Seems weird, but something's going on right now. And they rushed me down, put me on a gurney. They dragged me down, put me inside of this emergency vehicle, shoved my head inside of a CAT, a CAT scan that was in the the uh, emergency vehicle. And within two seconds, there's a television screen up in the corner. This doctor appears on a screen, and he was at uh, he was from New York Presbyterian Hospital. And the doctor said, "Mr. Williams, you're right. You." not only had a stroke, but you're still having one right now. We need to get you here immediately. So they rushed me to the hospital. And a little bit different than you, I ended up spending almost 30 days in the hospital because uh, my stroke was, I had a pretty pretty severe bleed. Um, uh, fortunately and blessed for me, uh, the blood didn't touch my brainstem or hit my spinal cord, which would have been catastrophic um, had it done so. Um, but I was... I'm telling you, man, I was, I don't remember much the first three days I was there. Um, I remember seeing my wife and, you know, looking at her and, and trying to figure out what was going on. But, and I wasn't 
so cloudy in the brain as much as I, I knew what had happened because the doctor confirmed it before I passed out. But during those first three or four days, I don't really remember anything. About day four, I kind of came to enough to be able to realize, okay, I'm in the hospital. I had a stroke. How bad is it? And then I started to realize I can't really sit up and I can't really move. Oh, fuck. I'm just keeping my mouth. I'm thinking to myself, oh, no. You know what I mean? How bad is this going to be? And then um, I, I set about doing some things about the seventh day. I'd been working with some other medical things myself that I started applying to myself. And on my, my eighth day, I said to a doctor who was treating me, I said, look, you know, I happen to know a lot. I think I know a lot about cannabis because I've been working in it for about 20 years. And I know that cannabis can be, certain parts of cannabis can be neuroprotective, especially CBD and some CBG. I have some capsules. I would like to take them. And they said, okay, let me run them down to our lab. Let them look at them first. And if they say it's okay, you can. And I'm telling you, on like the seventh day, they said, go right ahead. Just please, you know, if you're doing any other kind of cannabis, make sure you don't do that in the hallways and don't do it inside this hospital. I said, fine, but you can take your pills. I started taking, you know, four or five CBD pills uh, uh, every day. Um, I tell you, I tell you, four in the morning, four in the evening, um, every day. And I happen to notice myself specifically that it just seemed like, because on the fifth day, sixth day, they tried to get me into a rehab thing. And my rehabilitation just started moving so quickly um, compared to people who came in the same day. There was another woman who came in the same day with me who had a stroke. And two days later, another gentleman who came with me, came in the hospital, was on the same ward, who had the same type of stroke that I had. And they were on a trajectory that was going in the opposite direction of mine. Now, I'm not going to say that it was the cannabis alone that did it. However, um, I really firmly believe it impacted. And from that moment on, I started literally walking outside of the hotel, go up the block. But because I was on a walker, I'd go up the street a block and a half away, make sure nobody was around. And I found some some fairly, you know, I had some fairly decent uh, flour that uh, I knew was very high in CBD that I started using myself right then. And I'm telling you, every day I got better. That was from me. That's my perspective. For you, so you spend seven days in the hospital. Um, what kind of symptoms? It was nine days in the hospital. Nine but, days. Um, yeah, what, what, what caused your stroke? Do you know? You know, doctors even tell today have no idea why it even happened to me. Um, every doctor that I've talked to have said they called it a transient event because I had not had high blood pressure before this. Um, uh, though now since my stroke, my blood pressure has was elevated a little bit. I'm on blood pressure medication right now and will probably be on for the rest of my life to keep my blood pressure stable. But something, and we don't know, uh, there was a, they, they couldn't tell me if it was some sort of a you know, anatomical birth defect. Um, nobody knew, but I just had this weeping in that blood, major blood vessel back there in my cerebral. See, mine was caused by something called an, uh, an AVM, arterial venous malformation. It's similar yeah. to a uh, an aneurysm, Got it. Uh, but you're, you're actually born with it. Got um, it. I don't believe they know why people are born with them, but it, it's very rare. And they um, probably don't know why they pop at some point in time, right? Yeah, they did, they didn't know what the cause of it actually blowing my uh, my vein, uh, the vessel. Yeah. And before you go any further, Adam, let's talk a little bit about this, man. I mean, just like with me, I'm telling you, my friend, it scared the you know what out of me. I mean, I I, I literally had, I I think why I remember laying in that bed contemplating myself, especially day four when I kind of day three and a half when I kind of came to day four. I mean, I, I remember for me, uh, one of the most powerful things was the fact that my wife was there with her. She actually stayed in the hospital. She slept on a gurney. They brought a, they brought a little makeshift bed for her. She slept right beside me on this little bed. Um, nice of them. Every day. Huh? That was, that was nice of them. Yeah. And she slept there beside me every day for like 28 days. And she was really my caregiver because, I mean, you know, if, if I, I can recall many a time her running down the hallway and yelling at the nurses, you know, you got to change this man. You got to do this. Got to do this. Got to do this. Got to do this. And um, you know, I, I I think it was it was that connection that I had with her 
that made me really, really, really push myself to want to come back. Uh, but I will tell you, I had some dark moments, man. How about you? You know, it didn't really hit me of how serious it was until much later, actually. Um, really? Yeah, when when I had the stroke, I was in a relatively good mood. Um, the nurses were asking me when, when I first came into the hospital, they laid me down, they started asking me questions, but I, I couldn't communicate, I couldn't talk. Um, I would just mumble. So I, they're asking me my name. So I was trying to tell them, but they couldn't understand me. And they kept on asking for it over and over. So I started actually kind of messing with them. I just started talking and rambling on about different things. Um, but they kind of got the hint that I just I couldn't communicate with them. But while I was in the ICU, I I didn't really think it was that serious at, when it first started. Um, I knew what had happened um, when it did. I had, I had an idea just like you. Um, but when I was going through it, the post, um, you know, rituals and it just it didn't really hit me. Uh, it wasn't until I, I okay, well, okay. So I lost about 80% of my strength, 80% of my uh, stamina, my endurance. Um, so I, I understood that took effect. But what I didn't understand is that how much it affected my mind. And that's what was really the biggest issue. Um, when I would look for words, I would be speaking, I'd forget words mid-sentence. Um, I would get confused and I would just forget what I'm talking about. And that was worse than being weak, in my opinion. Um, and it wasn't until I started, I saw I started doing all the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, speech therapy, and I was feeling pretty decent, but I was also sleeping like 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day sometimes when I first started, when I first got home and I'm like, okay, I think I'm good enough to go work. So I actually got a job doing a uh, patient coordinator at a, a hospital. And the first week I was like, I can't do this. I, I'm exhausted. Um, the work isn't that difficult, but I'm exhausted. And so I, I had to leave that position. And that's when it first hit home. I'm like, okay, this is pretty serious. Because um, otherwise I was just doing the, the therapies every day trying to make sure it's going to build me just like uh working out uh just make it a habit and uh it took me i don't know a couple of years to finally get to a point where i was like okay this is my this is the new me um right. i'm happy with it a lot of uh doctors when i first started to go and see to see them they looked at my chart and they said oh this guy's going to be in a wheelchair and it, it was very surprising to me it, it kind of you know took me take me by surprise and i was like okay this is pretty serious yeah right well you know it's really funny now and i, and I don't say this because it's, we're not comparing apples and oranges we're just i'm just sharing with our listeners you know for me um i went through uh, they put me through occupational therapy and therapy at the hospital and the therapy worked really well um i did that for from about day seven up to about the 29th day though to the I left the hospital and then I went, flew to my wife's home where she's from. We stayed with her mother and her, her stepdad um, for about a month and a half, two months, where I went through physical therapy. I went to a therapy center and I'm blessed and fortunate. I have always been, you know, a person who's been a gym rat and I've always worked out. And so, you know, my recovery, you know, I, I left the hospital on a walker. By the time my third day of physical therapy, I was off the walker. And then from that point forth, I was really regaining faculties, physical faculties, much faster than uh, even uh, the therapist thought I would be capable of doing. But I literally, within, within 30 days, I was back to, you know, using an elliptical, using a treadmill, um, walking on a treadmill for, oh, man, you know. 35, 40 minutes walking on a run an elliptical for 35 minutes, then doing some weights. I literally actually got back into doing some weightlifting. So by the end of the 45th day, I was back physically like yourself. Um, I literally, and even till now, 
I'm, uh, you know, I'm one of those people. I I never napped when I was younger. I never napped before the stroke. But since the stroke, I I can tell you something. Easily three days a week. Um, and if you let me do it, I'll do it every day. But if, some days I have to work, so I'll work through the day. But I will I will catch a nap every afternoon. I I have to. I it kind of it resets me in the middle of the day. Not as much cognitively. And I will tell you, that was something I was really blessed with. Um, other than I had some, what I, I, I have to explain it is, I felt like it was like partial lockjaw. I didn't lose the ability to capture words. As a matter of fact, uh, by day nine, I mean, there were people saying, holy shit, I can't believe you had a stroke. I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I could recall, I could have gone off and done a speech for 44 an hour um, with that. But I had some issues with the back of my mouth. And I, I'm, I, I do it like that because that's exactly what it is. Almost like the back of my jaw with a connection just kind of locked up. And if I've been talking, I have to uh, stretch my jaw to get the words out. Um, and they gave me some therapy things to do with that. Like, you know, I, I, had this, I don't know if they gave you that weird little toothbrush that's got, um, it's not a toothbrush, it's like a stick with this padding around it where you supposed <laughs> to put it in your jaw and pull on it. Well, yeah, I, I was using that. 20 times a day and that strengthened my jaw and uh, bounced back. So then after that, I, like you, um, you know, I, uh, I fortunately and was blessed that I got offered a job hosting a show called Military Makeover that's still on the air now, I do now. And it was because of that show that I worked so hard to kind of get my speech back and to get my, this guy, but I, I honestly, I got to tell you something from the time from my stroke first six months, I lost 16 pounds. I've never put it back on. Um, I kept myself, my weight's been down. I stopped going to, I do go to the gym. I'll go to the gym after we get done today, but I don't lift as heavy as I used to. There were several doctors who said to me that possibly because of my age, and I'm not, for those listening, I'm not saying that weightlifting is bad for you and is going to cause a stroke. However, the kind of weightlifting I was doing before my stroke, a little bit too aggressive for a person in his mid-50s. A little too aggressive for a person who was, I was 59 years old. Oh, no, I was 61 years old. And, dude, I was still squatting, you know, 300 pounds. I was still lifting crazy weights that, you know, really unnecessary. So I've had some doctors say to me that it was, be, it may not have been because of weightlifting that day, but it could have been the cumulative effect of some of that really heavy, forceful stuff that I was doing, pushing blood to the brain, especially doing heavy squats and heavy deadlifts. I was pushing a lot of blood up there. And that's probably what my, my, my blood vessels have said enough where you stop this crap. And, uh, you know, and, and it's been a road though, man. You know I mean? Um, I would not wish this on anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely not. Uh, just so, to yeah. kind of uh, tell you a little bit about what I did also to connect with your uh, therapy. Sure. Uh, I actually played uh, video games because uh, my mm -hmm. right hand, I couldn't do anything uh, wow. with my right hand after. So I would play video games. I was pretty good at them. And so that's what I did, um, trying to bring back the memory of how I used my hand before. Mm -hmm. And I, I was absolutely terrible when I was doing it coming back. But my hand would be in so much ache, like pain, because it was so tired. And I was using it in a way that it, ju it was just dead to. Right. Um, but it really did help. When I went to occupational therapy, that's, they were like, OK, you look really good. It's, well because I play video games every day <laughs> to try and bring it back. <laughs> sure, sure, but, sure. So yeah. Something that makes the brain rethink how to yeah. get that dexterity back, right? Yeah, the memory skills. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's a tough one. I think, um, you know, again, like you said, and I said, I would not wish this on anybody. Uh, however, it also helps to define you a little bit in the sense of making you understand that you are much more capable of doing things than you think you are, right? Yes, it definitely did. It it opened me up to new things. I was always a quiet person. I was sh very shy. Um, and it really did push me to be more out there afterwards. And then what else is there to be scared of? You know what I mean? 
Sure, sure. And and so now, when did cannabis? When did the thought of cannabis even come to mind? Well, as one of my therapies um, for speech, I would do tongue twisters. I would also read articles, but I'd read them out loud. Um, and the articles I would I'd pick randomly, whatever came up. And I would tell you that, you that those probably one of the smartest things you did, my friend, because I'm telling you, for me, that was. It was almost, I think, day eight. I just grabbed my phone and started just Google anything. And if I saw something on a television, I Google it and just read it. And it did, I was reading stuff about cowboys. I was reading stuff about, it didn't matter. I was reading stuff about <laughs> gardening. I didn't care. I just wanted to read to see if my brain could recognize every single word that I would say. And yeah. I think that jars something loose back there in the middle of that head that says, okay, I'm still here, right? So you started reading and yeah, you just got to exercise what you used to use. Um, right. But I started reading these articles, and a lot of them that were coming up were cannabis success stories um, about all these different ailments that people were, you know, amazed at how it actually helped them. And, and of I had, the ones on stroke. Oh, sorry, was that? You said, of course, you saw the ones on stroke. Uh, I actually didn't. Oh, okay. I saw more about uh, cancer. Uh, seizures, MS, um, just different, different ailments, uh, different conditions. Um, and I thought, well, it's worth a try. I, mm -hmm. I'll try anything. Cause when I, at that point I was getting tired of speaking and, you know, trailing off and not knowing what I'm talking about. And what was the worst was forgetting the words when I would speak. So I thought, okay, if I can try cannabis, and if it helps, great. I've already tried vi the different vitamin Bs, um, multivitamins, mind enhancement supplements, things like that. But I wasn't getting the outcome that I really was looking for. So I said, why not? I'll give it a try. Walked into the shop. And this is back in maybe like 2017. And it was a time where you walk into a shop and smoke filled the air still. Mm -hmm. um, things weren't as regulated, but I started buying up different products because I had no idea. I had no experience with cannabis. I smoked it twice when I was younger in high school. Um, and then it, was, experience, right? it, it just wasn't for me at the time. And plus I had, I had a bias against it. Mm -hmm. um, that probably swayed my, you know, my end thought of cannabis. Uh -huh. So um, I went into the shop got a bunch of products and I quickly found out that it's, you know, a very detailed substance, um, dosage tolerance. I had no idea that was so important until I did over consuming. You know, I want to take just a half a second here because I think a lot of people may be out there listening and, and our, our, our viewers are, are tuned in and they're probably very intrigued. I got to tell you something. I had been a cannabis user before my stroke. So I'm very familiar with cannabis. As a matter of fact, I have products in the marketplace. As a matter of fact, the day I had my stroke, I was supposed to speak at an event in New York City. Uh, no, it was the next day I was supposed to speak at an event, which is a big cannabis uh, conference. And, um, you know, I will tell you that at the time, before my stroke, I was, a you know, I had a, had a very high tolerance. And so my journey with cannabis has been for 24 years. So the stroke happened after I've been using cannabis for 16 years. So, uh, and I've been using it for 18 years. So I've been using it enough that, you know, again, I had a very, very high tolerance and I could literally, and I'm not saying this cause I'm patting myself on the back, but I could probably smoke anybody under the bus. You know what I mean? Literally most people couldn't hang with me. I could consume so much. And, um, after my stroke immediately, it changed my, uh ability to literally consume it um as a matter of fact i noticed immediately the first time i tried something that had uh relatively high thc it put me on the floor um it threw me off balance i was really kind of shocked i was afraid of it and then because i had been using so much cbd and then you know i kind of train my journey kind of has been this way with it since I do not consume as much as I used to. I found out very quickly that, you know, for me, I get where maybe 
and inhalation would have lasted me, you know, 40 minutes or 30 minutes before my stroke. Um, inhalation could last me four or five hours after my stroke. And so my need for as much consumption, my consumption really went down. And even though now I still consume, but I don't consume at even a tenth of the level I did before my stroke. And this is now, you know, four years later, five years later. Um, I'm not as said for the first, I got to tell you, for the first full year, uh, I was extremely sensitive to high THC. Um, so my journey was looking for more broad spectrum cannabinoids and lowering the THC level. Then as my tolerance for THC has gone up, now my preference is still a nice THC product. However, you know, that's mingled in with, you know, other monocannabinoids. And I make sure that I do a broader spectrum always. Um, so for those at home, I, you know, everybody's response is going to be different. Mine is different from clearly from yours, Adam. However, you know, that's something you did, I think, the right thing because you started experimenting and titrating at very small amounts until you found something that worked for you, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it only I only started doing that after I took too much, and God. it's it's a really easy fix to avoid. Um, yeah. Always start any product small. Um, always, always you go. Yeah, you can always take more later, the very right. like the next day. Right. Um, so when I started trying these different products, I um, first started use uh, smoking and then i tried edibles i just went on different product types and it wasn't until i started to experiment with uh, tinctures i found a product that i felt assisted me um mm -hmm. i didn't take any type of laboratory experiment paperwork i didn't journal and do any type of research to show how it was helping me, but I, I felt like it was helping me. When you started um, to notice one thing I, I, I found interesting is that you started to notice that those words that you couldn't find before just started coming up naturally and, and occurring yeah. the way you needed to use them, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot words less often. Uh, say, for an example, I would forget 10 words a day, normal. And then the next, when I would start taking the C it was actually a CBD, a CBD tincture. Um, like you said, it's a full spectrum, but, um, it made me only forget words three times a day. And it, it's a big notice when I've had the trouble for a while. And then all of a sudden it started to stop. I even tried take, not taking the tincture for a couple of days. And I'd feel like I'd, I'd forget words more often again. Um, mm -hmm. and that's when I felt like, like cannabis could be special. Um, did you discuss any of this with your doctor? I did, um, uh, with my you, neurologist. And what did your neurologist say? Well, he said he wasn't, it, he, well, of course he said it was a good thing, but he wasn't sure if that was the reason. Um, because some time had passed where my brain may have come back in certain ways already. But in your heart of hearts, you knew that eh, I'm with you with that, buddy. But come on now. I know when I don't use it, I don't speak right. So something's wrong here. But I mean, I, and, I, and I'm not trying to, to cast any aspersion on your neurologist because I literally had a doctor who's a very close friend of mine who actually literally um, wanted to get involved in my cannabis business. And he said to me, because I, I said to him, he asked me, are you, are you using cannabis? And I said, I am, but I got to tell you something, man. I've noticed that I really have difficulty with super high THC products. This is maybe like seven months after my stroke. And he said, you need to slow that down. You were probably consuming some and you're probably, you don't even notice it. But when you take an inhalation or you take a product, you're probably taking it the same way you used to. And your brain's going to have to figure this out. Your brain's going to have to recover with cannabis because we don't even know all the things that happen once you take cannabis, how all the cells in your brain react to it. So he said, just slow down, Montel. And I, I remember, I'll never, you know, I always knew the whole slow as you go and, you know, less, less is better. But um, when he said that, I was like, you know, you know, you're right. Because 
and I'm trying to kind of catch up to where I used to be, and I don't need to do that that fast. And the second I slowed it down, all of a sudden, cannabis became the thing that really literally helped me really get back to functioning. That's great. Um, I, I'm a total lightweight when it comes to THC. Gotcha. Um, I could take five milligrams and I'll be at a, at a, at a comfortable high, but I'll be high. Um, I just had a friend earlier today, actually, she messaged me asking me what products she can take that she, and she had a high, really high tolerance similar to what you had. And so there's different products a person could take, but I just don't have to at the time right uh, right now. Like you can take, or you can take a uh, 20 to one products with CBD rich, um, uh, and you most likely won't get high at all. It's just um, the ratio difference that the THC is so low and the CBD kind of kind of combats the effects and yeah. helps out. Absolutely. And so now that you, are you are you more inclined to do edibles or tinctures than you are smoking or you do a little combination of both? Um, I'll mostly take tinctures in the morning. And then I'll smoke at night just to you know relax, basically. Um, I noticed one thing though, when I smoke too much or I take too much THC, some of the symptoms actually return a little bit because I have residuals of numbness, sure, uh, like the whole right side of my body down to my knee, um, and I'll notice like the slur will come back a little bit, or um, but never compromise my function besides the, the speech. But otherwise, um, it, it really helps out any way I take it. Yeah, I, I now for me, the same thing with you. I don't, I have yet, first off, okay, let, let's go back. Maybe two or three years before my stroke, I, I would sit in a room with you and four or five other people, boy, pass the thing, pass the thing, pass the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when I had enough. I mean, it's immediate. Like I'll, I'll take a couple of hits off, off of maybe a big banging high THC product, and you know I'll take a couple of hits, share it with some people, and then where I used to not stop, I my body and my brain tells me that's enough. Just stop for now, and I'll stop, and I won't take it. I don't care how much pressure you put on me. I'm not doing it. Now, now I'll, I'll give you a little example. Like you just said you five milligrams is enough on high for you. I got to tell you something. I can eat <laughs> in a two hour period of time. I can consume a, a 150 milligrams, and it doesn't overdo me. But now I kind of feel like, why am I doing that? There's no need for me to be that high, and I don't want to be that high, and I don't want it to stretch that long in that sense of that that euphoria that's like almost uncontrollable. So, you know, I'll take a – I might take 25 here, wait an hour, take another 25, and I won't do another one for the rest of the day. Um, and those are in forms of either gummies or other things. And, um, you know, there's – there's products in the marketplace that you can find, you know, candy bars and other things that are 150, you know, milligrams. But where I used to eat the whole 50 or I eat 100 of it, now I can do 10, 10, and 10, and I'm good to go for the whole day. I don't have to try to go after that big bang. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that I was really happy about when I read your your story is the fact that you find that balance for yourself, and that's it, right? Yeah, yeah, everyone's different. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no one fits all type of way of consuming cannabis. Is there um, one particular moment or a product that changed things for you? Oh, oh yeah, the when I first noticed um, some type of benefit assistance was a Select, uh, the company's Select um, mm -hmm. tincture. That mm -hmm. was the the product that kind of made me feel different got it so and in different in a, in a good way yes yes that's cool that's cool and that's funny. Uh, when i started trying all these different products i i come 
my my grandmother, my parents, they were very in the age of saying, no, you shouldn't use cannabis. But my grandmother had cancer. She had a broken arm at the same time. And she ended up using cannabis a couple of times. She, you know, fought me on it. I gave her like the 20 to one wild gummies to see if it would help her with the, the pain. And she said it made, it was night and day when she would take them. And she would, she didn't like that she was taking them, but she, she felt better when she did. Absolutely. You know, this is one thing that, that I got to make sure people, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there for listeners who are, who are tuning in. You know, everybody's experience with cannabis is different. But what we, I think what I want to explain to people is that sometimes you'll hear people talk about pain cessation or you'll hear people talk about, you know, being a little bit more or less scattered and more, more focused when they do cannabis rather than the opposite that people think happens. But some people become more focused. And that's really all the individualization of your endocannabinoid system. We have a system inside of our bodies that's kind of like a secondary sympathetic nervous system that we all have. There's CB1, CB2 uh, connectors in our brains with, that actually connect with that plant-based cannabinoid. And everybody's works a little bit differently and their effects are a little bit different. And so for those at home, you know, some people have asked me, well, do, do you really, does it really get rid of the pain? I like to say to people that rather than it actually ameliorating pain or literally making pain go away, it makes my brain not focus on the pain, you know? Yeah, so it distracts it. my brain from the pain. The pain is still there, but I'm not as focused on it as I am anymore. I can go ahead and carry on my life and do what I want to do. And that may be the way you respond to it or other people respond to it. It may not be. I mean, what advice would you give that person who's out there listening to us right now and thinking, hmm, would cannabis work for me in a therapeutic way? What would you say to them? You'd only know if you tried. Um, and when you do try it, you have to start at a low level as to not give yourself a bad experience. And that, um, that's probably the best advice I think anybody can get. And you're talking about it, whether it be with a, a edible or tincture or smokable. And w when we talk about, you know, like smoking, like a lot of people don't know, it's like, you know, <laughs> smoking anything. When you put that thing in your mouth and you inhale, well, you, there's, you're inhaling a certain volume of air and, and smoke. Well, you know, you don't have to go... <sighs> And so, you know, most of you will think you put it in and you try to suck it down deep in your lungs and you have to hold your breath. No, you don't have to do that. You don't have to hold it in. You can just go put it down. Yeah. Yeah. Wait you don't minute. have, you need, don't, uh, I feel, I feel like a lot of people think that they have to smoke the entire thing. No, you, you don't. 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 I'm a good Take one, take two, put it down. Put it down. And, and when you take one, it doesn't have to be a, yeah. You know, just take a, that's enough. Yeah, it's all finding that, that tolerance, that, that yep. range for you. Yep. And how are you doing now, Adam? How, how are you? You said that you still do have some residual symptoms. And I will tell you that I probably have oh, about 5% of mine. They're still lingering. And I, I try my damnedest to, to not overthink it because sometimes overthinking those things can exacerbate them without cannabis. However, some of the symptoms are still there, but I will tell you that my life has been a million times better with cannabis than it would have been without. That's my, that's me talking. Mm -hmm. um, I bet you say the same thing. It's been better with than without. Um, you know, uh, for you, again, I'd say, how are you doing now? How, where, where does Adam sit in Adam's world? I'm doing pretty good. Um, like you said, there are some residuals. Um, you just kind of learn to apply whatever you do in your day around them, working with them. Um, I'm, I'd agree with that. I'm about 5% residuals as well. I notice I feel them. Most people will say they don't see them unless, you know, they are looking for them and they're a doctor or something. Um, I wanted to know more about cannabis. Um, I felt like I started from absolute zero when I started getting into cannabis. And there was a lot of people that were in the exact same place where they wanted to use cannabis, but don't know how to start. They don't know what to look for. They would rather know what a cannabis product does before they take it. So it's like a little bit of a 
and security about getting into something they don't want to experience. And that's where I am right now. I actually started building my own site for cannabis. And it's called Cannabis Intentions? Yes, it's called Cannabis Intention. Why don't you give out the site? Give um, out the website right now so people know where to go. Okay, it's uh, cannabisintention.com, or you can do ci.reviews okay. if you want to write something shorter. Um, it's specifically to help people find their cannabis a lot easier. It's only for medicinal and therapeutic uh, related reviews without the recreational clutter. Um, I wanted to com basically combine the grocery shopping and cannabis products because I think a person or a customer should be able to meet their conception method preference and the intention of the end goal they want to find from that cannabis product. Gotcha. And then you uh, went back to work. You went back to work in the industry, uh, working yeah. as a blood tender, right? To gain some more insight from customers. Yes. Yes. I, I was. I, I made the site a mock site. I introduced it to about a hundred different shops uh, of my idea, and it was basically ninety-eight percent positive. Uh, a lot of customers that were overhearing me give my little speech about it. They liked the idea too. So I ended up getting a position at a at a uh, popular cannabis shop out in Beverly Hills, just so I can interact with patient or with customers. Uh, I stayed as a delivery driver and a regular store associate. So I would always be uh, speaking to the customer patient, as much patient. interaction as possible. Yeah. yeah um, and you're still no, no, that yeah. I, uh, I left that, but I learned the ins and outs of that particular business. And I felt like I, found the direction that i wanted to, to pursue with this uh this company super and how's it doing the company's doing good blowing up you you moving it around to other places you, around the country you know it's just starting um i am collecting all of the products from every state so mm -hmm. that people can review the product um for a medicinal or therapeutic way so that customers can see what people are using their products for and how so they'll be a little more comfortable if they want to try it. And also sure. I want uh, store assistants or, or butt tenders. Um, I want them to be, have those reviews as well. So that whenever a person comes into a store and says, you know, I have migraines, what can I use? They can find products that relate to migraines that they have in their store. So it's not basically them telling people this is going to help your migraine, but this is, I wanted something that will tell them this is what people are using it for and how it's helping them. This is their experience and it might work for you. Yes. Yeah, raise you the success rate of your product search. There you go. There you go. That's good, man. Thank you so much. I mean, that intention is is good and it's, it's something that's going to help people all over the country. So I appreciate yeah. it. Get out that website one more time. It's cannabisintention.com or ci.reviews. Okay. Uh, I'm also making a Kickstarter that's going to happen in the next week or two for the app. Um, right. so take a look at that if as well. All right, my friend, for sure. I'm well, well, I want to keep following you and, and keep abreast of what's going on. I want to keep being informed about how you're doing, and, and um, I'll keep sharing that information with others. And you know, I'm out of time today, but I got to say thank you so much for being a part of the show today, Adam. Um, this has been really great. I think that again, most people who have listened and tuned in today, you got to understand that we are not sitting here trying to tell you that this is the only way, but what we're trying to do is give you some information that's insightful, uplifting, and it goes to show that in unexpected ways, our lives can change and lead us toward paths that we never even ever considered. So again, I want to thank you so much for being a part of the show today. And to our listeners, I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Let's Be Blunt with Montau. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montau. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.